It's so fun. The bands there, we're talking to them. They're fans. We're fans. Like, this is great. We're, we go out to the area. We're on stage. And then they're like, hey, do you guys want to come on stage? We have a thing where a couple special guests come out and we just give them maracas and they just shake and dance for a while. <laughs> and I'm like, and I was so glad to be married to a woman who would say yes in that moment. Sure. And she it like wasn't even nervous and was like, yes, it's unbelievable. So yeah, we're on stage at Red Rocks, 10,000 people, probably our favorite band sitting there on stage with them at Red Rocks. And I was like, this all happened because a, a train went by. Welcome back, friends. Today, I drove a little over three hours over to Appleton, Wisconsin to meet with a guest that I was supposed to interview two weeks ago, but yes. he got sick. Not sick, exactly. I just didn't have a voice. But uh, <laughs> this, uh, believe it or not, is uh, the healthy version of my voice. I wish it sounded better, too. But Dude, you don't have an award-winning voice like I do. I don't. You do? Yeah. I was awarded back-to-back -back years now, most luscious radio voice. In Luscious. Eau Claire. Yeah, Eau Claire. I got little wooden plaques that are <laughs> sitting on my mantle. Ooh. I told my kids if I won that category, those plaques were going to stay up there forever. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like the dumbest award that I'm most talked about. But anyways, so yeah. welcome to the show, stand-up comedian Dustin Nickerson. Dude, thank, thank you for you. having me in your hotel room. Yeah, welcome to uh, welcome to the glorious and, uh, you know, you pull the curtain back and it's, it's pretty cool out here. It's a Courtyard Marriott uh, looking into a parking lot. I asked for a river view. They said no. They, <laughs> and they this declined. Is, this is somehow the second time I've interviewed in one of these identical hotel rooms in Appleton, the same exact spot. Yep. Yeah, it was pretty rad. So what are you doing out here? You're doing some shows here in Appleton? I'm doing uh, five shows at uh, Skyline Comedy Club in, in Appleton. The bright lights, the booming metropolis of Appleton, Wisconsin. Five shows seems like a lot, is it not? You know, I was texting a musician friend about this last night, and it's that's just the club model. It doesn't matter how many tickets you sell. They book you for weekends. And, like, you start off, well, I mean, everybody has a different path, but the comedy club model traditionally, it used to be you do a full week. That's oh. kind of where it comes from. Like, a comedian would come in on Monday or Tuesday and be there till the end of the week and then go on to the next town. Um, but now it's, you know, it's that 80s comedy boom is kind of over. It's switched to just weekends. So you come in around a Thursday, Friday, you do all the shows there that weekend. It's so it's not like you're not like it's not a reflective of like, man, five. They needed five. <laughs> like you were just yeah. talking about Charlie Barron's and four th sold out theater shows is a very different thing. Like whether or not you sold 100 tickets or 1,000 tickets, if you're a weekend act, they're booking you for the weekend. So, sure. So to answer your question, it is a lot, but it's not uncommon. Like I'll do five shows in Austin next weekend. I did five shows in Milwaukee two weekends ago. Sure. I, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's what we do. It's mostly just a logistical thing then for people. Yeah, and it is... Um, it is easier like on your body like to just be in one place for three or four right, days yeah. i mean i've been on big tours and that bus touring and like you're not in the same place and you're living it out of your suitcase that does get taxing yeah so this is more comfortable like weekends are but it's also way less efficient right so you hit way less markets um you know because you can only hit one a weekend yeah but you're juggling a lot right because you got a family and you're doing a podcast with your wife right, and you right, can't right, right. Right. It's not like you can just stay on the road because if you're on the road the whole time, you can't create anything other than the stand up and then maybe behind the scenes content. Or I guess you could potentially do Zoom interviews or something. But with it's, my kids. Yeah. Zoom, yeah. Checking on my kids. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I have no interest in being out more than I am. I uh, believe I, I really I, I tell people. They go, when are you on tour? I'm like, comedians are always on tour. Right. Was that's what we do. Yeah. Um, we are not like bands where we just go out for a few months and then we come back. Like we are, I'm, I always tell people I'm on a fireman's schedule. I leave around a Thursday, Friday. I come home around a Sunday, Monday. I left my house at Thursday. At, my alarm went off at 4.20 a.m. I'll be home or Sunday. Next week, I leave it Friday. I'll come home Monday. So we're yeah, that's what firemen do, right? You're gone three, four days. Then yeah. you're home th four, three days, whatever the week is. So. Sure. And then sometimes you're home. You have SoCal dates or wherever you're based. So it's... Uh, it's unconventional compared to a lot of jobs, uh, but it's it's for four days a week. I'm like dad of the year. I'm at everything. I'm sure. so involved because uh, I try and bank all my work on the weekends. I do 
every like email, every call, every video, all that kind of stuff, everything that I can put off till Friday, Saturday. So like any like businessy type calls where I have like with writers or something like that, they're always on Fridays. I'm only available on Fridays and sure. it's very annoying to them because they like to not work on Fridays. But but you've been doing stand up full time for how many years now? Full time? I'm not sure. Uh, six Maybe seven I was going to say, because you started pretty late in life in comparison to a lot of people. You didn't start when you were in college. No, 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 no. Yeah. I started way late. I was right. 27 years old. I had uh, I had been married for nine years and I had two kids. How old were your kids at that point? Because I guess me thinking like about my own situation, I hate that I have to do interviews on the weekends. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just because people are coming through, like I'm supposed to do an interview in Minneapolis on Sunday because this rapper is coming through that I'm right. a fan of. Right. Right. But that's kind of the precious time once your kids are full time in school. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. Like, there is, I would love to be home on the weekends. I'd be love to be home on every day. So there is uh, a ton of stuff that you miss when you're gone on the weekends. But also weekday support, especially as your kids get older, is a lot of their games and stuff are on the Wednesdays. Like my my I, my son had a track meet on Wednesday. Like you know, I was there for that. And my daughter's volleyball games are Monday, Wednesday. There is something to be said that you're more a more helpful spouse when the kids need that kind of weekday, like homework help and rides yeah. and a lot of different activities and stuff that they're going on. Like so, for example, this week, like. You know, on Monday, my daughter has uh, kung fu, like her to get her next like sash, uh, sure. you know, for blue sash. So like, well, I'm there for that because that happens during the week, not on yeah. a weekend or in my son's track meets. And and there's just a lot of like shuffling or my wife's like, hey, I need to. Some of it is like, I want to go have coffee with a friend. You're in charge for a while. All right. You know, so there are yeah. I, I would I would say it's it's just you're you're valuable in both scenarios uh it would be a little more fun to be home on the weekends but actually i'm probably put to work a little more by being home on uh on the weekdays sure yeah i mean that makes a lot of sense so right now what all do you do you have a podcast that you used to do with other comedians and stuff where you were interviewing them now it's just you and your wife and you're doing it with this podcast network are yeah, you yeah, working yeah. So on we... a special and stuff like what all things are you currently doing oh man uh, a million things. Uh, regularly, I'm always touring. Uh, you know, like I said, we're we're never not touring. Approximately, how many days do you think out of the year? I do. Would you say you're touring? I do this year in 2014. I will do 46 weekends. Oh, okay. So and I that's would, Thursday through Sunday. Sometimes it's less. Okay. Sometimes it's Friday through Saturday. Yeah, sometimes sure. it. But I'll be out. I will get on a plane or drive somewhere, or I'll be working 46 out of the 52 weekends. So okay. it usually breaks down to about 200 to 250 shows a year. So and is that no like a normal pace for you all the time? Or? Oh, for me, yeah, I've been on that pace since I quit my job. Wow. Okay. So so we do that, and then me and my wife have a podcast called "Don't Make Me Come Back." There, it's a funny podcast about family. Uh, we just got brought on by on Nate Land Entertainment, Nate Bargetzi's network, and uh, we do that when we're there. I have a book. I have. You're always working on a million little projects, you know. But it's all everything is fueled towards stand up. Stand up is the goal. Everything I do, the book. The clips, the pod, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, come see me live because right. that's where I make my money and it's what I'm best at. So if you like me doing other things, trust me, this one I'm actually good at. <laughs> sure. I've worked really hard at this one. Yeah. I mean, you still might not like me. <laughs> yeah. I might not be for you. Uh, Jimmy Carr has that quote where he said, like, um, if you see a comedian and you're like, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Or if you see a comedian, you're like, this isn't funny. You're both right. Yeah. Like, because that's what music and art and comedy, right. they all are. Like, you can love a movie. You can hate a movie. You can hate a show. If you're like, hey, Rings of Power, that uh, that that show sucks. And I'm like, I actually like it. We're both right. Nobody's right, wrong sure. in that scenario. So it's all meant to fuel stand-up. You know what? The music and a lot of other things, people have a personal branding. So then they kind of have to fit within that to a certain degree, mm. which is why people love everything this person comes out with or mm -hmm. just doesn't like anything that it comes right. out with. Right. Do comedians kind of have a personal brand that they stick to? Yeah. I mean, there's different comedy is so big right now. Like it, it's gotten so much closer to mainstream that we have like genres essentially so and, and we always have but like there really is like whatever you like there's probably some version of it whether you like like super dark like 
sociopathic stuff. Like, sure. all right, you got Anthony Jeselnik for that. Like, mm-hmm. you want, like, dirty? That exists. You want crowd work? You want someone to, like, do stuff with the crowd? Matt Reif's huge. Ian Bag's huge. Like, you want clean comedy? That exists. You want someone to talk about being single? That probably exists. Someone to talk about being married? That exists. Like, it, comedy's so big, and there's so many comedians right now that we totally have different genres. Uh, what the comedian themselves likes, comedian, comic-wise, is almost always totally different. So so what genre would you fit in? And do you find yourself as like life goes on and things keep changing where you want to kind of move into different zones? Because even like music artists, again, they kind of bend genres all the time. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You can be Post Malone and suddenly be country. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, for sure. Uh, I, um, yeah, I mean, you... The one thing that I've always want with my comedy is just to be authentic to who I am. Right. And so I'm a fairly clean cut guy who just is like mostly a family guy. Like, I mean, I spend four days a week in, in school pickup lines and, you know, like uh, complaining about PTA people, the PTA and, 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 you know, ooh, sorry, train in the background. Where's the train here? There's, uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I've not seen any. Uh, is it on the river? Um, the uh, I'm like a family guy who's like constantly just doing family stuff. Like I'm a family man. So most of my comedy is about that. I always joke around like with uh, some of my comic friends. Like, oh, my new hour, I'm really branching out. Yeah. I'm going to talk about marriage, my kids, uh, aging, and my dad, which is all I've ever talked about for now my third or fourth hour that I'm working on. So. Sure. Those are the things that I like talking about, and uh, as my like popularity has grown and is still growing, I'm not trying to get everyone to like me. I'm just trying to get the people that like me to find me. Yeah. So like this is what I do. I'm, if you, you don't like it, that's fine. Yeah. So like I had someone ask me like recently, is like, would you ever go on Kill Tony? I'm like, listen, I respect Kill Tony and everything they're doing. If you're a Kill Tony fan, you're probably not gonna like what I do. I yeah. just, I do a different thing than them. And that's great. Like, we have different genres. Like, you know, like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Like, you know, I'm trying to think of an example. Like, if you're like an up and coming rapper, like a Ken Carson, like, you're not going to tour with the Stones. Right. Yeah. Just what, you're <laughs> going in front of the wrong audience. You're what, going in front of the wrong audience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And what you're looking for are those core fans that realistically will buy a ticket. That's mm-hmm. like the whole point, right? Is all of the social media and everything, the podcast, all of it is just kind of funneling towards that. Yeah. And you really are kind of like, I think a lot about, I'm, I'm, I don't remember who I said, heard say this, like, you really are kind of curating your content, your jokes, your memes your reels whatever it may be to like kind of your top five to ten percent fans like these are the best ones that i have the people who most really understand what i'm doing and i want to make sure they like it yeah you know i still as long as i you know like and they they tend to be they like what i like you know they 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 kind of most rock with what i do so every once in a while you do have to kind of like shake the tree a little bit and get some of like the like every so often i'll do like a political joke and i'm not a political comic at all but it'll just be enough to ruffle feathers to kind of shake off the fan maybe prune the tree a little bit of like hey eventually you were gonna turn on me you were gonna i was gonna say something that you didn't like because like politics is a great example of like i don't take any stance politically and i've never have publicly like and uh I I shouldn't say that, but like, I'm not like, I'll never endorse a candidate or like, I have people who like help me with some of my social media and they're like, we don't know what, how you vote. And I'm like, good, keep on guessing. I like that. But even the idea that you would talk about the topics Mm -hmm. is like outlandish. So like during like the BLM stuff, I may would make, I would talk a little bit about that and people would like, how dare you, you know, like, and it's important every once in a while, but like, hey, I'm still gonna talk about these social issues because I want to. Yeah. And my top five to 10% fans really like it. And you were gonna leave eventually anyways, because I even mentioned that an election was happening. They're like, why right. did you go political? I was like, is this political? Yeah, but I think again, if you're trying to appeal to too many people, then you don't really appeal to anybody. You know what I mean? Not, yeah. not a strong enough connection yeah. anyways, because they can tell there's a barrier there. You're yeah. not really giving or, yourself over. even worse, you appeal to everybody except yourself. Sure. Because nobody truly has no opinions. 
Right. Nobody in, I mean, this is what Jesus talks about, not to get all biblical on you, is you sure. gain the whole world, but you lose your soul. Like, you could gain every fan in the world and just constantly say the most agreeable thing out there. Yeah. But if there's a, there's got to be part of you. I, you've seen it with comedians and, and certain artists that at a certain point, they're like, hey, man, I kind of want to express how I feel about this. Right. You know, and, and to do that at a certain point. You're gonna lo- you're gonna lose some people. Yeah. Well, and I think I mean your own values and beliefs change, you know, subtly over time, and eventually, like different things, whatever. But you're on camera a lot, whether it's podcast or like filming a special. Have you ever put out a joke or anything where like yourself now looks back and you're like, I don't agree with that anymore. I don't. I kind of wish it wasn't part of that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, not. <laughs> I don't have joke regret that uh, probably a lot of comics do, uh, but there are certain ones that you're like, I'm, that you just go like, ah, I wouldn't say that now, you know, but I, it's not even words. Like, oh, that's not entirely true. I used to have an old joke where I said uh, gypsy in it. And like, that's a word now that just, even that kind of aged poorly. Right, that yeah. they're like, people are like, ah, this is kind of, yeah, we don't really use that anymore. And you're like, okay, so there is stuff like that, but I I don't know. For what I do, that doesn't come up a lot. But there are times where, like, for me, you gotta. I like listening to what the audience has to say. So, like, the nice thing about live performance is you get instant feedback yeah. with instant perf- like instant um or with like it, it, like online stuff. You don't always know how it's gonna be received. So, like, I had a joke once. I was like the it was something about parenting. It was something along the lines, just like a tweet that I screenshotted. And it was like, you know, like being a parent is like always loving your is like loving your kid 90% of the time and 10% going like, I should probably put this up for adoption. Sure. And that was it. And there were a lot of people in the adoption community, which were like, hey, man, this sucks. Yeah. Because a lot of us feel like our parent, like a lot of us who were adopted feel like this is why our parents put us out because sure. we weren't good enough. And I was like, all right, message received. I think I deleted it and was like, hey, my bad. I didn't, you know, yeah. like that is like the sentiment there is comes from obviously, hey, man, parenting is hard. Right. And 10% of the time you're like, what have I gotten into? Yeah. But if there's a community of people that's like, hey, dude, this sucks. Like right. talk about. And then you think about that whole idea of punching down. You're like, I mean, I'm not trying to make you know, adopted kids feel right. bad. Yeah, yeah. The joke <laughs> hit not the way that you intended necessarily yeah, to that community. Yeah. And like in a room, I imagine you don't have enough concentrated of that particular group of people exactly. speaking up so you don't know, like you're not getting that feedback in that moment that this is No, they not would just stop do. being your fan. Yeah, sure. And, and like that sucked. Up. And, yeah. uh, but that uh, that's to me, I mean, that's why I think listening to your audience is important of just being like, I mean, sometimes they do have some valuable feedback and all they're trying to do, some of them are all getting mad and you know, yeah. and they're just like little keyboard warriors and stuff. But some of them have legitimate points and are just helping you try to grow as a person of like, hey, did you ever think about this? And you're like, no, I, I didn't at all. I feel like a lot of people have a hard time swallowing their pride, though, in those situations. Like people double down on things when they're wrong a lot. A hundred percent. Yeah, and I, I think that's true. And I, I also am just like, Write a different joke, man. Yeah. That's what we do. Just yeah, move on. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, they feel like your children, you know, your jokes and you get really attached to them and you work really hard on them. And you have to tell yourself, particularly with online stuff of like, as long as you mean what you're saying, like I have a joke that's like gone big a f- couple times about like why I need both political parties in my life. Yeah. And it's just a joke about, for my life, I need my tax guy to be Republican. I need my barista to be a Democrat. Yeah, I've seen that one. Yeah. yeah, and that always is almost universally received well. And then there's always some people who, like, I, I, Wisconsin's a swing state, so you're going to get right. this. Like, there are snowflakes on both sides. Yeah, totally. I'm, I am here to tell you there are people in your life. It's not a political thing. There are just some people who can only receive a joke from someone that they know 100% believes what they believe. Mm -hmm. And that person, I'm fine with getting mad. I, 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 if they, if I click on their profile and their profile is any type of flag, I'm not saying (laughs) any flag of any type, then I'm like, okay, this is your identity and this is who you are. And that's fine. I want that for you. 
I'm not going to really Tammy Pescatelli had a quote once where she said comedy is for everybody stand up comedy is not yeah. and I do think that there is a truth to that and asking the internet to to like give you the benefit of the doubt and be nuanced in their take is unreasonable just let them get mad that's part of what they need right. it's like a video game for them and that's that's okay so uh yeah there's always going to be some people getting mad and but sometimes there are valid points so i right. try and sit in the middle and be like is this worth listening to and uh sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't i know that you have like well, I guess it hasn't been that long of a career, but a long enough career that we definitely don't have time to cover like everything in one interview. <laughs> um, that's but, good. That's good. To, that's well, nice that's why feeling, you can yeah. spread your podcast over hundreds of episodes. Well, right? it's, it, yeah, talking. it's like sometimes people will be like, I can't believe you know that fan's name. I'm like, well, if you've been a fan long enough, you were at a point where I, I knew you all because I had like 20. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it is nice to get to the point now where I don't know every fan's name. Sure. But yeah, I can be San in, in San Antonio and I'm like, Sophia. And they're yeah. like, how do you know her? I was like, oh, she's been a fan since I didn't have a lot of fans. Yeah, but I mean, that happens with like Instagram and stuff all the time. Although you don't remember that their name is Sophia. Their name is whatever their profile is. But yeah. you see the same people that uh, like and comment on every post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And you're like, you just want to send them love of like, you make my career happen. 100%. <laughs> like, 100%. Please keep so doing grateful, that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it is like cliche or in like, when people are like i you know i do it all for the fans and we need you i couldn't do this out with you and you're like if you're in the ticket selling business that is gospel truth i mean yeah. the majority of the money you make as a touring stand-up is touring right so you're like i i need you guys to buy tickets yeah so, so really it's just those like that top i mean however big your audience is whether it's one percent or ten percent or whatever but like those core people are the only reason you have a career and that's why i think like it it does matter how many followers and whatever you have, but that's why like the difference between 10,000 and 100,000 followers doesn't necessarily matter because it's the quality of who those people are. Like, 100%. are they actually going to show up? Are they going to interact yeah. with things? Yeah. You know what I mean, well, and when you think about like, take my like Instagram, that's my biggest. It's like 270 some. You spread that out across America. That's not a lot of tickets. Let's say that's not, you know, right. that's a mid sized American town. And, and so you do need great fans in those areas who spread the word and invite friends and then you gotta do promo and all those things. So it really is like you, when you have a fan that's like that old idea of like a brand ambassador who's mm -hmm. like, you said your neighbor's a fan of mine. I'm like, great. right? Tell more people, please send them my clips. Like I love going on an Instagram and when they'll show you how many people sent your clip and you're like, that's the best news. Yeah. Is this shareable? Is this something that you're just like, so when people post like a cool picture of them as a stand up, I'm like, what? Who's yeah. sharing that? Well, that's actually, yeah. So I was listening to or watching this interview with the CEO of Instagram a little while ago. It kind of went viral, so you might have seen it too. But he basically just said that the only analytic that shouldn't say the only, by far the most important one is sharing. Sharing, And yeah. so it was, even with the show, it kind of had to shift how I was using social media because it was like, okay, before things would work better if I because I had started my show and or my page kind of personally I guess I've always used it as like my personal account as well yeah and so I had built a lot of relationships with people in my hometown so if I post family stuff or things that were me personally they would do better mm -hmm. but now everything has shifted because of like why would you share something about me Right, like you right. may want to see it because like you're you interact you know me personally or whatever but you're not going to send a picture of me to your friend no. it's not sendable shareable content no 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 not at all like in some people some acts like it's different they're like if they have the if they're like a taylor swift who they're like icons yeah. and they just post a cool picture of them people will share that because they just love that artist there are artists like that i'm not one of them i'm just <laughs> a, like i'm a middle-aged dad who if anything people don't want me to be cool <laughs> right yeah well that's part of the persona right that's yeah. what makes you relatable well and... i'm not <laughs> sure. i'm not even yeah, you're wearing a bucky sweatshirt yeah so. <laughs> i mean i do cool things sure like i have a cool job yeah uh i get to go on tv i get to do fun stuff i've met cool people i'm not one of the cool people and so yeah you are right that there is a certain like you start to understand not just like what you want but like what do what side of me do people want what's shareable and i i think about that with content we talk about this with my wife and our producer at the end of each 
thing where we go like we did our pod and you're like what are the clips right and you go well like that was funny and that was interesting and maybe that was insightful but that was shareable so mm -hmm. like one, one i posted yesterday was um uh what was it it was um i'm gonna i want to remember this without looking it was a it was a clip that i knew was gonna be gosh you post so much con i'm just gonna look uh <laughs> i was like don't don't this is bad radio podcasting the the clip was oh the clip was i looked at an article of why millennials and gen z are so into halloween okay and i was like yeah, okay let's let, yeah exactly and i'm like this will share mm -hmm. i'm now a lot of time i'm wrong but i'm like this is interesting it's timely it's our generation people are going to have something to say about this and sure enough it's selling you know the one i did before was like uh, me just essentially talking about how much I hate sports. I'm a huge sports fan, sure. but how much pain it's put me through, and I wish I would have picked Disney Adult. Yeah. That'll share. So, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's relatable for other people. Exactly. And again, like what it's something they could send to their friend, or their, you know, and whatever. You're trying to add value to people's lives as a yeah, comedian. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm, I don't, I hate important in comedy it's not to say comedy isn't important it shouldn't be important i hate when it's trying to be important yeah sure and you're like but if like you're sitting here you're just a normal person you're living your life you're at your job you're having your lunch you get on your phone i'm, I'm trying to make you laugh yeah <laughs> uh, dude, i think you're in like the perfect industry right now i was talking to somebody else about how i really think we're going to look back on today and go wow that was the meme era like that's just what we're going to call it yeah because that is what everybody's phones constantly are full of right now for a lot of reasons we won't go down that rabbit hole but for a lot of reasons it's funny stuff is what does the best so i think comedians yeah. are really reaping the reward of that right now if they're trying to do that like if they're proactively making the content yeah. for that which i think like i talked to tom takar about this oh, I love um, tom. dude he's so funny so funny yeah. and i actually interviewed him at my house he actually came to my house oh. unlike you no, I'm just kidding. well i'm sorry was he in a claire <laughs> yeah though? he was yeah. in a claire yeah. um but but anyways like how the content you make for social media versus your stand-up is different but you sometimes are filming clips yeah for social media and that but you know what i mean it's hard to do because you know they're different things they are and i i'll admit like sometimes i can get really sacred about the live show and that i'm like this is for them first the right. audience the people who are here but you know moments happen or a crowd work what i don't like is like i don't like the feeling of like fishing for clips up there right of like i'm just trying to get something that it's not really important to me how it goes for this audience it's important to me how it does on the internet that sucks for your live audience that sure that they don't want that and but there's a space for that right there like, is a space there's like for open that. mics locally you do with friends or other comedians 100%. to work through stuff well and 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 re and the good news is sometimes you can do both like if okay. there is like a topical a lot of comics they'll do like topical jokes of like things that are going on and i've done that before too like uh whether it's politics or sports or taylor swift or something like that like you know a lot of comics are posting like diddy jokes right now and stuff like that like and for some comics that's what their audience wants and or the crowd work clips can be huge for certain comics um uh so yeah you are you are just kind of trying to merge the two, but the good news is after you've put out like multiple specials and you have things out there, you can kind of pull from that of just right, like, this sure. is just a timeless joke about parenting or aging or sleep or whatever it may be. Yeah. So, well, I think like, I forget if it was Dina or who it was. Like I told you, this show is not Dina's about... Dina's a great topical joke writer. Yeah. She's so good. She's One just of hilarious the in yeah, general. Yeah, yeah. And I think her writing for The Daily Show probably mm -hmm. is part of the reason she's so good at that or, you know, kind of kind of vice versa. Yeah, um, she's fantastic at it. I Real wanna, skill for it. I want to talk about how I, I was talking to my buddy Wayne Hoffman, which there's a catching up with Wayne Hoffman episode coming out. Wayne Hoffman changed my life. He's like one of my all-time favorite people people um he's one of the bigger illusionists in the world okay um he got big long before social media i interviewed him in florida like four years ago like a long awesome. long time ago and we've just maintained friends and yeah. he texted me two days ago that he was coming to wisconsin uh, so cool. i drove out and and anyway so we did yeah we were catching up um but anyways he was talking to me about how he's hopefully going to have this netflix show come out like they're mm -hmm. pitching this tv show and he had um a, a gen zer who is like working with whoever go oh that's going to be great for your social media mm. and he was like whoa like yeah, to me the shift, tv yeah. show yeah. is like the biggest thing but right now 
it's kind of like both coming up no longer is it like when i interviewed best selling i asked her hey did getting on netflix change your career and she said no mm. like maybe a, a tiny bit but right now we're in this weird shift where going viral on instagram could have a larger impact on your career than having a special come out on Hulu, right right you know or whatever but you've kind of had both not necessarily viral but you've been well, growing I've, on social media and i've never had a streaming network care about me uh is everything on youtube yeah. all the ones i watched were on youtube mm -hmm. i thought something was on amazon or something i did but that released in two places oh, and that was okay. like an option and it wasn't because amazon wanted it they oh, didn't buy it from me we just, just also it uploaded it to youtube or okay. to amazon so did you do that exclusively because you couldn't get interest from one of the other platforms, oh no or? no streamers are not buying what i'm selling they have no interest in me okay and why is that there's a lot of reasons i think um the quickest one is it's i'm not what they're looking for sure. i'm not um i'm not a hot up and comer like discover him right. we're about to give you the world this person right, right here and i'm also not huge that i'm gonna guarantee ratings sure so you know netflix for example has limited spots and so they're like okay well we're gonna give them to our whales like that's a, a gambling term our big acts right like yeah, okay. uh our dave chappelle's and our bill burrs and our shane gillis's and our taylor tomlinson's and our nate bargazzi's and like ones who we know everyone's gonna tune in for this person right, yeah and that's where most of our budget goes and then we're gonna help you discover some new up-and-coming oftentimes younger than me acts who we think you should know and that's a cheaper gift for them but they feel like it's like a because we're like it you've got to like remove yourself personally from these things because we right. are managers agents streaming networks executives we're stocks to them just stocks that they choose to or not invest into and i'm like a kind of established but not like huge stock yeah, you know yeah. what i mean like you're not a penny stock that's either gonna pop exactly. or guaranteed i or a guarantee right. like your money is i'm somewhere in between those things right. and so i'm not really what they're looking for like i there's literally i have this new hour that i'm touring and nobody wants it like and that's okay i you try not to it sucks it would it would be nice yeah. it would be nice to get uh someone give me a nice check but ultimately i just want to give it to the people that's right. all i really care about is my whole goal is getting fans and it would be nice if a big platform picked that up but even that's not a guarantee i mean beth saying netflix didn't change her career right just because it's on netflix doesn't mean everyone tunes in so um well, and look at like Sam Talent. His like last special he put out was on YouTube. Yeah, and it crushed. And it crushed. That was yeah. crazy. And but he had the Kill Tony boost, like obviously oh, helped Rogan him. and a million things. But and I'm just saying he tell. chose to yeah, though. Exactly. He chose to put it on YouTube rather than because I imagine he could have gotten it somewhere else with like how much momentum he had. But I don't know. He chose to. I actually don't know about that. Sure. Like I don't think yeah. that that I don't I don't know it's Sam. Hard to say. So yeah. I'm gonna I I wouldn't guess one way or the other. Sure. I actually would guess. Because I don't think a comedian would ever, to me at least, it's Netflix or kind of bust. Like, if it's not Netflix, then like Amazon, I'm not big enough that I have a fan base that's going to go watch it for sure. Yeah. And I'm still trying to get discovered. Hulu's getting in the game right now, which yeah. is interesting. And Peacock, too. Yeah. Like they're look, all doing it. Hulu's is interesting because Disney's behind Hulu, yeah. obviously. So they've got some big ones coming up. But ultimately, it's like... You know, my last special has like 600,000 views on my YouTube page. And you're like, I mean, that's a lot of, I mean, 500,000 is a gold record. Sure. Like, so there is amount of me that you're like, I mean, that's prob. I can't imagine that amount of people going and turning on Amazon Prime to watch the special. Yeah, well, and realistically, like the main me, point of it is to advertise yourself again, to funnel yeah. people to yeah. see you live. So is it better to get a paycheck, but then only have 100,000 people see it on Hulu? Yeah. Or is it better to have 600,000 people see it without getting a paycheck and then yeah. those people coming? Yeah, and so, then the other thing is how much do you need to put out a special? Some of that's like a creative, like... Andrew Schultz is one of the top comedians in the world, and he has, I think he's put out two specials. Sure. You know, Nate's also one of the biggest, and I think he's like four or five in, but then there, it's like there's 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 just different ways to do it. Right. And uh, I'm trying to kind of, to kind of back, I'm just trying to be 
you know, everywhere. Like, right. that's what I always say. People are like, are you online? I was like, wherever you are, I'm there. Except yeah. Snapchat. I'm not on there because it doesn't feel right. <laughs> and it's like gone, going away anyways. But I think it is important to be able to be readily available because any inconvenience, you'll have a huge drop off. That's why like when people are developing websites or apps or whatever, every single click is a huge drop off. And they're yeah. like, how can we make it as few clicks as possible right, for right. somebody to be able to see whatever this thing right, is? Right, 100%, yeah. Yeah, in my like career since I started, and I know this is audio somewhere, has just been like this. There's just been like a slow incline yeah. my entire career, which everyone tells you is better, by the way. They like to tell you that at the, they're like, if they've peaked or they're peaking or they've yeah. hit a moment, they're like, this is the way to do it. This is more sustainable long term. And you're like, yeah, yeah, no, I know. But like there's 40 people in the room. <laughs> yeah, no, dude. I, but I felt that way about like my show. Like I've interviewed like I remember I interviewed Lamorne Morris from that show. New Girl. He mm -hmm. just won an Emmy for his his role on, I think, Fargo or whatever. Yeah. I interviewed him a long time ago when it was just audio. I didn't have like many downloads per episodes or whatever. And it'd be like, hopefully this will blow it up. And like, it definitely yeah. didn't, like no. it was cool. You know, he shared it and like, it was definitely really cool. And then it helped me get other guests, but it has been like a really, really steady thing versus I've, I've, I know a lot of influencers as an example that have really popped at one time or another, but what yeah. I've seen with some of them and in general, just talk to them about is they hit that high from when it does go right. and it isn't sustainable. And then they get discouraged and quit or right. in general, they're chasing that high kind of right, forever. Right, right. Yeah, no. And I think that there is like my kind of mindset and I talk about this with my wife all the time is like I'm just uh like I, I you know we were a couple of years ago we were touring in London opening for Tomlinson and and there was this we were out like uh having a couple drinks with the the one of the 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 stage managers this guy named Reese and he was very complimentary and him and I hung out a bunch all weekend and and he was like, you know, he's like, you'll be back. This will be here. And I was like, dude, I'm not, I don't think you even realize how far behind I am to do something like this. And he just goes brick by brick, mate. And I it's like become my mindset, like yeah. not that he invented that phrase, but right. it like really stuck with me. And I told Mel, I was like, that's that's us. We're just brick by brick. Even a thing like this, you're like, you got a couple thousand listeners. Great. Hey, I'm Dustin. If I get 10 of them, fantastic. Yeah. You know, um, I think the big part for me is once you hit sustainability, like you're yeah. at a place where, you know, you're making enough money where you can pay your bills. Right. Anything additional is great. And you're working towards it. Right. But you have what you need. Yeah. For well, it to keep going. I mean, I think the nature of what this pod is, which is, you know, you're talking about people pursuing passions, particularly careers. I think about my goals uh, like when I started and they haven't changed. My first goal was I just need this to be my job. I just want to be a stand-up comedian as my profession. Like my last day job, I was working middle management at a rec center. And I remember I would just go to comedy club websites. And I'm like, I just want to be one of the faces on the website. If I can be one of the faces on the website, that's the big goal. And then the second goal after that was I just want to go to every city, play their best club, and then start getting people to show up and see me. So now really my only remaining goal is that last piece of getting fans. And that is kind of a helpful filter of I'm like, will this help me get fans? Yes, do it. Is there is there a chance that this will give me some exposure and play? Does this not help fans or engage the fans that I have? Then don't do it. So it's a, it's yeah. a waste of my time. Which is an interesting thing in our world right now, where you see people who will like, they'll be like, do you want to get a sitcom? I'm like, I don't know that that'll <laughs> help me anymore because yeah. we aren't in a world right now where the sitcom stand-ups are like it's not the 90s anymore like there's been a couple recent ones like uh that where like big shows have you know like uh like brett or as you know roy kent from ted lasso like that launched his sure um stand-up career but that's pretty rare anymore where like people aren't there's not one thing that everybody watches anymore so it's yeah. not really helping careers the way it used to well and that's act acting is a different career <laughs> It is you know a different I mean? it's career. It's a whole nother skill set and but thing in the, to do. But it wasn't always that for stand-ups. The right. goal for a lot of stand-ups used to be to get a sitcom. Right. Because then you would be Romano, and then you would be Seinfeld, yeah. and then you would be Paul Reiser. And like this would this was kind of the trajectory was to go into 
stand up, get a show, and that was going to launch your. Yeah, but stand-up. I mean, I interviewed Billy Deuce. He's another comedian. He actually mm-hmm. is the guy who opens for Charlie all the time. For oh, Charlie great. Bands. Yeah, yeah. So they have a recording studio together in Milwaukee, and I'm friends with Billy, so I've recorded down there. Nice dude. But when I was talking to him last, he was talking about how he really wants to like do some TV stuff. Um, and it, and when it broke down, like talking to him about it was like, that's because that was the vision before of like, that's when you make it is mm. like when you get on TV versus Charlie Barron's is like massive on the internet. Right. Oh, and yeah, so yeah. it's like, I'm, I'm friends I was, with Charlie. He's Wisconsin Elvis. I always call it. Uh, hell yeah, dude. yeah. Put in a good word, dude. He doesn't respond to my DMs. But anyways, um, he doesn't but, respond to my DMs either. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I was just talking to Billy about it. I was like, yeah, but if you think about it, realistically, some of these skits that you're doing with Charlie are going to get more views than something you would have done on Comedy Central. Oh, not even close. So I mean, way like, bigger. Right. So like, why is the goal really to be on TV anymore? Yeah, I think there's like a weight to it. First off, it pays. That's one of the main reasons. Right. Sure. Instagram, there's no money there. Yeah. I mean, even if you're, unless you're big, big, but even then it's, it's pennies. It's like gonna, product placement. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, TV money is different right. type of money, right. you know? So like I can do one episode of after midnight and get a check from there that's bigger than what i make in three months on instagram yeah you know it's not um especially because i'm not when you're in the stand-up space you're not chasing a lot of like brand stuff i mean the podcast ads help but like anyways i i digress from that the it's not even close the internet stuff is is way bigger but it can be hard to then convert them to stand up you know what i mean i think to have been like if you're doing now charlie's done a fantastic job guys like trevor wallace have done that really well there are acts that have found their way doing it um but i think that there is like a legitimacy to it because you're like at least for like my age because in your mind you're like i've had a lot of viral stuff and i'm really grateful for it the first time that i did late night felt way better right because it was like the curtain went back and there's james corden and oh my gosh kevin bacon is on the show this feels like real Sure, but yeah. the other side of the coin, and then we will get to a song break because I know I'm taking a bunch of your time now. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but I was talking to Wayne about it again with this TV show of like sometimes TV stuff is a little bit flash in the pan of like 100%. you don't carry those people the the beautiful and beneficial part of like social media. Granted, different platforms can change and things can happen, but still, generally speaking, you gain fifty thousand more followers on Instagram. They just keep seeing your stuff or they keep oh, yeah, following absolutely. along, you know, over time, which has a lot of value. You're, you know what I get a lot in uh, Mel always talks about it. Mel's my wife. Uh, the look where people look at me in like an airport in public, they go, I've seen him before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And sure. if you have enough clips that kind of do that, you're like, I had just someone like I was checking out of a car. Um, I was getting a rental car a couple months ago in Portland and the girl kind of looked at me and she goes, do you make videos? And I laughed and I was like, I was talking to my comic friends, like as a comic, you don't want to hear that. You want to yeah. hear like, you're a comic, you're a stand-up right. comedian. I love you. Like, do you make videos? You're I'm content like, creator. <laughs> unfortunately, yes, I do make videos. I am, I am out there. You've, you've seen probably something of me at some point, you know, <laughs> dude, speaking of being recognized, this has uh, been kind of a new thing for me that's happened. I was at this fall festival thing for Viz Eau Claire downtown mm-hmm. and I had three different people come up behind me and go, are you, are you that passion pod guy? Yeah. Cause they recognize my voice. They didn't know what I look like. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. There is something to like, they kind of have to see and hear the whole package to put it together. Yeah. Cause we've all done that in public where you're like, okay, it looks kind of familiar, especially if I'm in like LA, like an airport, like certain airports. I'm like, are you famous LA? Yeah, if sure. I'm in Nashville, I'm like, are you famous where there's famous people? And, uh, you know, you're always looking through first class, like anyone famous up here. And, you kind of need to see the whole package. Like, if I'm like this, like if I'm glasses, hat, I'm very identifiable. Right. If I'm no glasses, I'm invisible. No, like, because I just, people don't know that is the look from that they're used to seeing me. Because pretty much it, my wife said that to me a couple of years ago. I was like, if you post, put your glasses on. That's, yeah. they want to know that it's you. Uh, and same with the mustache. Like, they're like, I'll post an older video. And they're like, who's this guy? Right. Yeah, that's funny. Um so the um i I was working with i i opened a a lot for taylor tomlinson she's like my best friend she's like a sister to me at this point because we were open micers together and uh she'll talk a lot about how like she's like when we go together it's like we're fair i mean she's much more famous than me she's like we can kind of blend in she'll get recognized for sure uh but if you start talking 
if you hear her voice like yeah. the host of a late night show like she's like it it's 10 times more likely I'm going to get recognized because now they know it's me. At first, they're like, eh, that kind of looks like... And a lot of times when you see people on TV, their makeup and their hair and the yeah. same thing, like, you're like, this is the best version of me. Uh, but yeah, the voice can do it. And in your world, the voice is... Otherwise, you're totally anonymous. Yeah, which is funny because, like, I'm also very, uh, like... I'm very identifiable with all the tattoos and yeah, the jewelry yeah, yeah, and everything. Yeah. Like especially in Wisconsin. Yeah. Like if, if you've seen me once, it's easy to remember who yeah. I am. So I want to hear some stories because you've traveled all over the place, uh, touring with a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. Taylor being one of them. Um, but my other friend Austin, who I told you uh, was a big fan of yours, is also apparently a huge fan of Nate Bergazzi. Right. What's right. your favorite Nate story? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, touring with Nate anymore is so probably the i'll bury the lead is beating him on one-on-one -on -one basketball is probably my favorite <laughs> one um touring with nate is like comedy camp nate loves the hang so it's there's a bunch of comics there's a bunch of people there and we uh we played like some pickup basketball and it was like there's always basketball because he's playing in arenas and arenas all have a basketball court so we'll play on those and we did like a team game where like it's just comics there's for like, by comic standards, I'm a pretty great athlete. Sure. By normal human standards, I'm very middle of the road, but I'm upper echelon for There's comic. a lot of comics that smoke a lot of cigarettes and drink a lot. So exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And even the ones that don't are just unathletic, you know? <laughs> sure. I, and we we were playing like a big pickup game and I'm very non-competitive. Um, and so I just like, I'm like, let's get out here and have some fun. And I'm going to pass a lot. And, and Nate and I were probably the two best players. So we were, just, I was passing around. My team lost by a bunch, but I was having fun. I, I barely shot. Sure. Um, Cause it wasn't really like fun for me to shoot more fun to try and get people involved yeah. and have a good time. And then later Nate's like, you want to play one-on-one -on -one, like later that night. And I was like, sure. I'll play some one-on-one -on -one. and it's like a, a gym and uh, he's like, let's put 10 minutes on the clock. And I was like, oh, okay, Ooh. that's different. 10 minutes on the clock, whoever's winning when the buzzer goes off. And he was like, oh, and like, for whatever reason, we also use like the women's ball, which is like a little smaller. Slightly smaller, yeah. And I was like, okay, you know, I, I mean, Nate, I saw him play early. I think we're fairly close. And then I just got like unspeakably hot <laughs> from the arc. And I beat him in 10 minutes. I beat him 42 to 7. Oh, God. <laughs> Steph Curry made an appearance. <laughs> and I just, he wouldn't guard me. on Because at a certain point, you're like, I, I, he would check up. And I just kept hitting that top of the arc three. Yeah. And he's like, what in the, I hit like 11 in a row at oh some point. And he's like, what is going on? And then, and then he guarded it and I would get around him. <laughs> and I was just like. <laughs> and now it's not really an impressive athletic and he beat me so i beat him so bad that i was a little worried like uh oh <laughs> you know this guy's paying me to be out here yeah. on tour uh but i uh, that's it's uh, in those like groups and some of the guys i used to play basketball with, i i i always get called like i'm like annoyingly athletic that's what aaron weber he's a comic he told me he's like you're dustin's annoyingly athletic and i've been called deceptively athletic that sure. you're just like you wouldn't guess it and again not that athletic it's just who you're compared to <laughs> you just you wouldn't look at me and go that guy could hit a bunch of threes in a row and um, sometimes i can you just got to put the goggles on dude. i've with worn goggles before ben, yeah. i i just play with the glasses now sure yeah yeah sure. i switched to using them a while back and i was like this is really helpful seeing out here <laughs> yeah. i was just sh shooting at this blurry thing 30 everyone's like you got a really good mid-range i'm like that's as far as i can see dude my my <laughs> eyesight guaranteed is worse than yours somehow i can't see anything okay yeah. so i think um it kind of takes people like nate or taylor or whatever people that you come up with people who are above you i feel like you learn the most from those people who are more successful what are some of the, who are some of the people that taught you the most that helped you get to where you are and what are a couple of the lessons that you had learned yeah you know taylor is interesting because taylor's way ahead of me and we learn from me she's way ahead of me career wise but you start at the same time we're the same yeah. time in and yeah. she's a little more a couple more years ahead of me but i actually didn't really get to know her when we were open micers it was a little because i mean 
I mean, what did I have in common? She was like a 19 year old girl. I'm like, sure. how's school going? You yeah, know, like yeah. I'm like a full adult man. We're not friends. Uh, but we, we, we've, I've learned watching her career plenty of stuff, but like the, we don't necessarily teach each other lessons. Nate's interesting. Nate's 10 years ahead of me. I've learned a lot from Nate. Nate is kind of like a comedy mentor. I try and grab anything and everything I can from comics. Like, um, you know, one thing that Nate told me that that I guess I, I guess Jesselnick told him is he said like ninety percent of what you're gonna get in this industry is gonna come from other comics, and I think about that a lot. Like you never, and that comes back to another thing I got from uh, one of my mentors and friends, a guy named Zoltan Cassis, who was very funny. He's in Madison, I think he's in Bloomington now. He's in Madison last night, and he said like, "Be nice to everyone. You never know who's gonna get what," and that's that's great advice like you like people didn't know that joe rogan was gonna have the biggest podcast in the world right and then he did and now you're like how did i treat no i'm not i'm not a peer but how did i treat joe rogan people didn't know that taylor tomlinson was gonna be the host of a late night show and now she is how'd you treat her along the way like i just think that um there really is something to just treating everybody kindly and then suddenly and being hardworking and being funny and being professional and 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 showing up to do the job and not getting drunk on the job and just being a pro because suddenly and I feel this right now you 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 start to have a lot of support behind you you have bookers and agents and comics kind of all pushing they're rooting for you and they're like you can hit up somebody like hey can i do your pod to promote a thing and they're like yes because the people are rooting for you and i think there really is something to just having a day job like mentality to your non-day job of like you a lot of you are funnier than me and maybe somebody that um the industry picks which i don't get picked for a ton of stuff but you will not outwork me and especially, like, I've had people tell me before, like, I look at what you do as a father, and I'm like, I'm not working hard enough. How did Dustin learn how to edit videos? I was like, well, COVID. I wrote a book during COVID. I did the things that you, I had downtime all of a sudden. So, um, so there is, uh, it's like, really is like cliche and basic, but like hard work and just being kind to every pe- people. Margaret Cho did an interview where she's like, the people who've really sustained in this career are just the people that kind of kept showing up. Yeah. Just like you did, it's like, you know, Appleton, it's like my sales aren't incredible here. This is my fourth time in this market. I'll keep coming back. You just go to work. Yeah. You just go, you're on, you, you give them the best live show you can. You write during the day, you film some clips, you, you go on to the next town. Well, I think it's about being like, it's not about asking for favors so much as it is like being the right person when an opportunity pops up and being top of mind in that scenario. Right. You know right. what I mean? So Absolutely. like if you are nice to people consistently and it and again just being consistent, like you're dependable. They know yeah. if somebody vouch like if they vouch for you that you're not gonna blow it. Right. But a big part again is just being top of mind because when people are like faced with that whatever situation it is, like, oh I gotta I have to have a comic for this. Or right. I have to have entertainment right, for right, this. Right, right, or right. I have to like think of somebody that could take this position. Like I got offered this, but I can't do it. Who could I hit up? You know what I mean? You got to be top of mind with those people. And honestly, like the being nice thing isn't even just to that person. Like it's not even just to like Joe Rogan for him to make that decision. It's like somebody that they know saw you and either said a good thing or they said a bad thing. And then that thing goes into people's subconscious. They don't even necessarily remember specifically that they heard something bad. Right. But but they know that like. I don't think that's the guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, word spreads. You know, we're not... I mean, comedy's big right now, but there's not that many comics. And people... You name a comic, comics have kind of a universal feel on that person. Yeah. Like, that guy is an a-hole. That guy's super kind. That guy... A guy like Tom. You brought up Tom earlier. Everyone says the same things about Tom immediately. So funny. So nice. Yeah. People just say that immediately because that's the reputation that you get. And... Uh, yeah, it really, it just, it just goes a long way. And it, it does go a long way to become somebody that people are rooting for. Right. You know, and that's based usually on just how you treat them. So I would say like 90% of what you're going to get from comics. And that's great because that means ultimately who you're trying to be kind to and supportive of are your peers. And then also like be kind to everyone. You never know who's going to get what. Yeah, totally. Which if it takes you a selfish motive to be great, 
whatever at least you're being kind now <laughs> yeah well yeah for sure i mean it's just one of those things where karma like you don't do it with the in- you don't do nice actions with the intention of it coming back to you but it just does and you just kind of know that it's going to so it's better to just be like that yeah so i think like you've obviously and again we don't have time to like sit here and talk about all of your tv appearances and all the different things that popped and were like awesome but you get desensitized to like cool situations as mm-hmm. as more and more of them come like yeah, totally. when i first like interviewed i remember in the second season it was maybe like my 12th interview or something i interviewed this rapper named cashanova who's not like huge but in minneapolis like he was somebody i was personally a fan of and aware of mm-hmm. so like when he responded to my dm I was like oh my god this is so cool i was actually in seattle at the time when i got the dm back and i was like oh my god yeah. like i was so stoked and as time went on i interviewed more and more and more people and i get desensitized to it a little sure. bit because yeah. i'm like oh yeah i've met a lot of people in this like like pro skateboarders i've met a bunch of them at this yeah, point yeah, yeah, still yeah. cool but i don't have the same like <gasps> kind mm-hmm. of a thing what was the last time that what was the last thing that happened to you that you were truly like genuinely really excited about hmm that's an interesting question because, like, I will tell you, I'm very even keeled. I don't like. I'm not prone to high highs and like low lows. Um. I really, there is really something to like being on set that I really enjoy because they're like little celebratory moments, because they're like gatekeepers who said yes to you. So. You know, pretty much all of like my late night stuff, both my cordons and like after midnights, they're great. And they're really great to bring like my wife to and kind of share with them, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, probably, I mean, it's been a little while, but the first one that I was genuinely so, ex- I'm, I wish I had a more recent example. It sounds like I'm not grateful, but it's, it's not that. It's, uh, you know, probably like, the probably my first late night which was you know like it was the first time that tv had said yes to me you know i'd had some other stuff like a comedy central one but that was in a comedy club in the town that i live in so it didn't feel quite as like grand and but those moments of my wife's here taylor's here uh it's just a you know i had a great set you just you've been working for 11 years into this and then you know the the curtain pulls back and then you go out and you have a great set and then you know like you stay in LA in the night and it's fun. So like, I would say like that, that was probably, yeah, that was probably one of the, the is still like, it, even though it didn't really help my career a ton, it was still very validating and probably still, that first late night is probably still the career highlight for me. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you put people up on a pedestal, you look up to them, and then for them to acknowledge you, yeah. and acknowledge that you're good, it means so much more than all of the followers on Instagram yeah. or all the other people, because in your, like, they're, their opinion is valid, yeah, you know, but you still know in your mind, you're like, but you don't, you don't know really if yeah, I'm yeah, good yeah, or yeah, not, because yeah. yeah. you, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just like hoodwinking yeah, you yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, here, I actually have a non-comedy one that it is kind of career related, and this is, because there was a moment recently that I happened and I go, this might be the coolest thing I ever do. And so the the long version of the story is, like during COVID, this would have been 2021-ish, uh, I did a set on a show called Keep Your Distance, it was with Kev on stage. I was the only white comic for this like all black crowd. And this these clips like went like viral, viral for me in a couple different ways. And one of them was this very basic moment where I'm on stage and a train goes by right after a big punchline. And I go, oh, even the train liked that joke. And that like did fine. And then, you know, this crowd of all black people, one person like raises the roof. And I was like, yeah, that's not me. I'm not that guy. I don't, you know, and I make a, I'm just riffing at this point. I say yeah. something like, you know, I don't, uh, you know, it would be a character turn if all of a sudden I was just like to the window and that worked. And, and I was like, no, I look like I love a good acoustic guitar song about a river. <laughs> that was the riff. Totally joke. Never said it before. That joke went crazy viral. And then the band, The Head and the Heart, who has a big song called Rivers and Roads, commented on it, right? And they're a Seattle band where I'm from originally. Fast forward, we start DMing, we connect, I meet, we like go to a couple of their shows here and there. Fast forward, they're 
doing Red Rocks for in and which is one of the best yeah. venues in the world, if yeah. not the best venue I've ever been to, and outside of Denver, it's on our 20th anniversary, literally the day of. And, or maybe the day before or something. And Mel and I are like, let's just fly out for our anniversary. We'll go to the show. They'll give us tickets. So we're at tickets. They We get there. The tour manager's like, hey, you want to come backstage, you know, before? There's like, my, you know, ah, it's unbelievable. This is great. Uh, this is so fun. The band's there. We're talking to them. They're fans. We're fans. Like, this is great. We're, we go out to the area. We're on stage. And then they're like, hey, do you guys want to come on stage? We have a thing where a couple special guests come out and we just give them maracas and they just shake and dance for a while. And I'm like, and I was so glad to be married to a woman who would say yes in that moment. Sure. And she it like wasn't even nervous and was like, yes, it's unbelievable. So yeah, we're on stage at Red Rocks, 10,000 people, probably our favorite band sitting there on stage with them at Red Rocks. And I was like, this all happened because a, a train went by. This all happened because of a riff that came to the pop, of, like just popped into my, that, I mean, and then you're on stage going like, this is it. This is the love of my life. This is a band. I mean, their biggest song, one of their biggest songs called Honeybee. That's Melissa's name means honeybee. I was like, this is it. This is a fantastic moment. So that moment I was absolutely not desensitized. And I was on stage going, oh God, music is so much cooler than comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I, but I feel like when you do stuff like what you do or on a smaller scale, what I do, you it's not like that situation was bound to happen, but different ones similarly sure, are kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. bound to happen at some point or another just because of the situations that you're in. So you don't know what what's going to happen. You can't really plan for it that no, way. No, oh, but God, they, no. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? But different ones do come up all yeah, the time. Yeah, you can't reverse engineer. No. <laughs> How do I get on stage at Red Rocks with the head and the heart? Yeah. Well, I don't know, man. Yeah, <laughs> you exactly. tell me. Well, so that was cool. I was not desensitized to that at all. Now, you know, uh, you know, the next time I go on TV, I'm will be like you said more and more desensitized to it but not that moment dude you weren't desensitized to be on this podcast hey well, nice segue dude thank you for having me this was really fun thank i gotta get uh, over to green bay and then drive all the way back home and then drive all the way back this way tomorrow Ooh, yeah for uh my girlfriend's family christmas because some of her family goes south so i gotta be in wausau so i'm doing a lot of driving this week. man wisconsinites you do that dude you, you for just, real yeah you just knock out three to five hours but blinking. here's the thing is I used to fly to LA for one week and record a whole season of my show in one go. Yeah. Like that's what I would do for like season two through six or something. That's pretty much what I did and record all of them in a hotel room. This is so much more mellow. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? I still that's get to lot, go home. Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's give a shout out to where everyone can follow. You said Instagram's the best spot. Um, spell out your name and then where people can see your special, where they can find the podcast. My name called. is Dustin Nickerson. Uh, you know how to spell Dustin. Last name Nickerson. N-I-C-K-E-R-S-O-N. I, uh, I have a special called Runs in the Family on YouTube, a podcast. Wherever you listen to podcasts, I'm out there. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon.